everyone. Welcome to the, we'll tell you what we're reading from the Waltham Public Library. Today, my colleagues and I are talking about books and taking our show on the road, the virtual road that is, as we tell you about some of the titles that we've been reading. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, technical difficulty. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, we'll tell you what we're reading from the Waltham Public Library. Today, my colleagues and I are taking our show on the road, the virtual road, that is, as we tell you about some of the titles that we've been reading and enjoying, or not. If you have titles that you're also enjoying, please let us know by including them in the chat if you're watching us live, or comments if you're watching us on demand. My name is Laura Bernheim and I'm the head of reference at the Waltham Public Library. Joining me are my colleagues, Greg Carter, Amber Harvey, Liz Rior, and Dana Hamlin. We look forward to sharing our titles with you, but before we do, I'd like to share some news about what's going on at our library. We are available virtually 24 seven through our website, walthampubliclibrary.org, link in the description, and on the phone Monday through Friday, nine to four at 781-314-3425, or at waltham at minlib.net. We are also available for contactless pickup for your holds Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4. We have several events and programs coming soon. Our children's staff is running multiple story times and other activities on Facebook Live. Just join the Waltham Public Library Children's Activities group page through the Waltham Public Library Facebook page. In addition, they are hosting concerts, and art and science activities on Zoom. Our technology, teen, and English language learning departments are running classes and activities on Zoom as well. Please visit the library website and click on events calendar for more information as well as who to contact for Zoom links. The link for the calendar is below in the description. Our upcoming book club meetings are Saturday, September 19th at 10 a.m. We'll be reading Crooked Hallelujah by Kelly Jo Ford. On Monday, September 21st, 7 p.m., you'll tell us what you're reading. On Thursday, September 24th at 7 p.m., we'll be reading An American Marriage by Tayari Jones. And Monday, September 28th at 7 p.m., we'll be reading An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon. You may email me at lbernheim at minlib.net for the Zoom link for any of these meetings. Coming up on our YouTube channel are the following events. On Tuesday, September 15th at 7 p.m., we'll be um, discussing the 1918 Spanish flu, the pandemic before this one with Dr. Jeremy Brown. On Tuesday, September 22nd at 7 p.m., the rights and wrongs, black women and the history of voting. Tuesday, September 29th at 7 p.m., the power of protest images and the black freedom struggle. And Wednesday, September 30th at 2.30, we will be back here again telling you what we're reading. You can stream these programs live or view them anytime after the event. And finally, for those of you who watch a lot of YouTube videos like yours truly, you know that this is the part of the introduction when the YouTube content creator asks you to hit that subscribe button and to like our page and to visit their sponsor. The only reason I know that companies like HelloFresh and Skillshare exist is because I watch a lot of YouTube. However, while I am definitely asking you to please like and subscribe to our channel, we actually don't have any sponsors. Instead, we have the very best of friends. If you are able, I would like to encourage you to support our friends of the Waltham Public Library. Our friends group is responsible for so many wonderful things at the library, including our Museum Pass program, arts and crafts supplies for our youth services programs, speaker fees for outside speakers, and my personal favorite, food for our book club programs, when we're in person, of course. Zoom has not perfected their technology yet, so we can offer food at our book club programs right now. You can join for $10 as an individual or $20 for an entire family. You can find out more about our friends by clicking on the library friends link on our website or Click on the link in the description below. All right, that's enough of my introduction. Without further ado, here is what we've been reading. Let 
me, give me one second while I share my screen. All righty. So Shuri was my first book by Nick Stone. I was very excited to read this as I really enjoy Nick Stone. I loved the Black Panther movie as well, which features Shuri. For those who are not familiar with the Black Panther universe, Shuri is the youngest, younger sister of T'Challa, who is the king of the fictional African country, Wakanda. In this novel, Shuri is 13 years old and is dealing with typical teenage problems, wanting to be noticed by her family and getting annoyed with her friend. She's also trying to prevent a das disaster that could erase the entire existence of Wakanda. So, you know, kind of what I was doing in eighth grade. No big deal. I'm enjoying this novel, including the fact that despite her extraordinary circumstances, Shuri does read as well realized and a very real 13 year old. It does help to have some knowledge of the Marvel universe, especially X-Men and Black Panther. There is a cameo that I won't spoil, but I think someone could appreciate it on its own. Nick Stone writing really does help with that. Um, if this is your introduction to Stone's work, I really recommend Dear Martin and Jackpot. Far be it for me to usually recommend a program from another library, but if you have, are a teenager or have one in your life, Nick Stone is doing a virtual visit with the Boston Public Library on Monday, October 19th at 12 p.m. for teens only. You can visit their website for more information. My second book is Darius the Great Deserves Better by Adib Karam, which has actually been released just today. I was lucky enough to obtain an advanced reader copy. This is the sequel, I'm sorry, this is Darius the Great Deserves Better. This is the sequel to Darius the Great Is Not Okay, which I adored that book. I don't know if anyone else has read that. Darius, who's fresh off a trip from visiting his mother's family in Iran, which took place in the first book, is enjoying an internship at a local tea place and is navigating things with his first boyfriend, Landon. Darius is a fully realized character who has complex and loving relationships with his parents, his sister, his father's mothers, as well as classmates such as Chip Cusimano. I appreciate that Darius's sexuality and ethnicity are a part of his identity and woven into the fabric, but not his whole identity. And I love that he has quirks, like he always refers to people as his full names. Uh, full disclosure, my mother also does that, so I felt a bit of a kinship with Darius. I'm really enjoying this sequel so far. Um, Hood Fem um, my next book is Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. If you're not familiar with Mickey Kendall, you should be. She wrote the text for my recent favorite graphic novel, Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists, a graphic history of women's fight for their rights. Given the recent 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which theoretically gave women the right to vote, but in reality, not all women, especially black women and other women of color, it's important to read this book. This book highlights how it's important to remember all women when fighting for women's rights, not just straight cis white women, and how to make the movement more intersectional. If you're a Twitter user, I definitely recommend, in addition to reading her published works, to follow Mickey Kendall on Twitter. The Unlikely Through Hiker and Appalachian Trail Journey by Derek Lugo was an absolute delight, even for a poser hiker like myself. I like to pretend I hike, I own hiking boots. I've worn them twice in the last year and a half, if that much. Um, Derek has decided, decided to hike the whole Appalachian Trail, something his friends in New York City very good naturedly make fun of him for doing because he also uh, was not originally a hiker. He certainly could, is considered one now. This book details his adventures, talking about the bonds that he makes with other through hikers and the phenomenon of being, unfortunately, one of the few people of color on the trails. Really fun and thoughtful book. I read it so quickly and I was really sad when it finished. Derek Lugo is also a great follow on Instagram. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. Uh, and that oi was for how I felt about this book. This is a prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy and I thought it was okay. I listened to it on audio and Santino Fontana does a good job. Santino Fontana, by the way, is the voice of Hans from Frozen, which I may or may not be obsessed with that movie. Um, I think Honestly, though, I'm just done with prequels. Um, answer questions I didn't have in the first place, which every prequel seems to do. Did you care where Han Solo's last name came from? I didn't, but Solo was going to tell you anyway. Did you care where Voldemort's snake came from? I didn't, but Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was going to tell you anyway. 
anyway, it also probably doesn't help that, quite frankly, I've become less enthusiastic about the Hunger Games trilogy in general over the years. Wayward Son by Rainbow Rowell. Like Hunger Games, I've also become less enchanted with Harry Potter over the years. And frankly, J.K. Rowling's attitude about transgender women has not exactly compelled me to continue being into that series either. Shame on J.K. Rowling. However, unlike my previous book, my disenchantment with the source material has only strengthened my love for Rainbow Rowell's faux fan fiction of, her, of an Airsoft Harry Potter series. So you can follow this. Wayward Son is the sequel to Carry On, which is actually the fan fiction of the fictional Simon Snow series written by the fictional Kath and Rowell's novel, Fangirl. Did y'all get that? On its surface, these books may just seem like a gentle parody of teen fantasy novels like Harry Potter, but they really stand out on their own. The characters are more fully realized than a certain famous British wizard, and the books are just really funny. And I understand there's a third one coming out, and I, I just can't wait. Finally, my last one, Party of Two by Jasmine Guillory. Guillory became my favorite romance writer, heck, one of my favorite writers, period, when I read her novel, The Wedding Date, in 2018. Her novels all feature a diverse set of characters. One, if not both, of the main halves of the main couple are almost are always African-American. The women have a lot of agency. The side characters are well-rounded. The couples have healthy relationships, imagine that, in which communication is rarely a problem. When they do fight, it is usually for a very substantive reason and not for a typical rom-com reason. In this novel, Olivia is a lawyer, just moved to Los Angeles from New York City, meets Max, a US congressman, while bonding, bonding over dessert and romance ensues, as it often does when sharing cake. Fans of the wedding date will recognize Olivia as Alexa's sister, and we even laugh at a Easter egg shout out to an event in that book. I like this book just as much as Guillory's others and was very hungry for cake after. Though all of Guillory's romances do take place in the same universe, it is not necessary to read them in order, but it does make you appreciate some of the Easter eggs like I had mentioned. Okay, so that is what I have been reading. I am now gonna invite my colleague, Amber. Thanks, Laura. I've heard good things about Party of Two, so I'll have to add that to my to-be-read list. I was lucky enough to come back to a huge stack of books waiting for me after vacation. So some of the books I'm gonna talk about today were in that stack. And I'm going to start with Normal People by Sally Rooney. This novel follows the on again, off again relationship between two young Dubliners beginning in high school. The book has made nearly every best of list in 2019 and Rooney has been called the voice of millennials. So spoiler alert, I'm not a millennial. And in fact, I'm actually probably nearly old enough to be Ms. Rooney's mother, but I believe the book's appeal does reach across generations. And Normal People has also been made into a critically acclaimed movie that is available on Hulu. Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. This best-selling title is a relevant and timely novel about race and privilege set in Philadelphia and is about the relationship between a privileged white mom and her 20-something black babysitter. One night, the babysitter is in an upscale grocery store with the little girl when she's accosted by the store security guard. This was, um, as you can see on the cover, a Reese's Book Club pick. And it's also been long listed for the Booker Prize, which coincidentally will be announced tomorrow, um, which is August 26th. Drinking French by David Leibovitz. This gorgeous book encompasses French drinks from day to night. Recipes for cafe drinks, aperitifs, and cocktails are featured in this book that goes beyond the ingredient list to tell the reader about French drinking culture. Leibovitz is a food blogger, a writer, and a chef, and um, in the book also includes a chapter for tasty snacks that one can make to accompany the delicious drinks. It's got beautiful pictures, fun side notes, and it's just a really fun look at French um, drinking culture. And last, that Cheese Plate Will Change Your Life by Marissa Mullen. 
I love making cheese boards. So I was super excited to finally get my hands on this book. Mar Marissa takes step-by-step -step instructions. She accompanies these instructions with beautiful illustrations of the finished board, along with drawings and pictures of step-by-step -step that walk the reader through the process of creating each board. She calls it cheese by numbers, and it's really, she uses simple ingredients and simple steps to, to create these deceivingly simple looking boards. What I especially like about the book is that the themes are fun and yet simple, which at this time when our parties or get togethers probably don't look quite like they used to, it's quite nice to have. So she focuses on easy to find ingredients that make it possible to create a board for a casual weekday family dinner or even a board um, for solo movie night. And now my colleague Greg is going to share what he's been reading. Thank you so much, Amber. Uh, I've been reading mostly fiction, but that uh, cheese book is making me think otherwise. I, I definitely had to have to change that because that just looks amazing. Um, hello. Um, so my name is Greg, and um, I you, there's going to be a, people are going to notice a theme in my books. Um, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy, and uh, so that's pretty much the composing the entirety of my list. Uh, the first one that I um, have on there is Good Omens by uh, Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. We actually just did it for a book club recently. Um, and the reason, one of the issues uh, when picking a book right now is I like a lot of apocalypse movie, um, movies and books, and I also like a lot of humorous stuff. And it's like, which one do I choose? And Good Omens, you don't have to. It's, um, it is kind of the apocalypse hasn't been funnier. Um, suffice to say, the premise is, is that um, the forces of heaven and hell have been pretty much preparing to um, set about the end times right now. And they've had like a representative um, on earth um, for these thousands of years, an angel and a demon. Uh, the funny thing is, though, they've been kind of so removed from their supposed forces that like a um, kind of like a Cold War comedy or something like that, they've realized that they really just kind of um, like each other. And there's not, they don't really want the world to end because there's a lot of fancy restaurants and lovely things like that. So um, they decide they're going to try to fix that and change it and hilarity ensues. Um, it's there's also been a mini series that's been re released um, that is really good, but I'd highly recommend the book because there's a lot of parts of it that um, I feel, un while understandably left out, just make the story all the much uh, sweeter and funnier. Um, the next book I read was um, that I brought up is actually nonfiction. It's a uh, Ghost Land: uh, An American History in Haunted Places by Colin Dickey. Um, so I, I try to, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to ghosts and ghost stories and things like that. And I've tried to get into places in shows like Ghost Hunters and stuff, but it's just so over the top that I really, I don't enjoy it. It's just, I, I can't help but roll my eyes. This book is very different. I, I don't feel like it, it's, it's almost more like somebody wrote, it's like a book on anthropology because the, the author is not interested, he's not really interested in determining whether or not a place is haunted. He's curious about why people become obsessed with a place. Like why do we appropriate tragedies or tales and make them out to be these epic things or what grows naturally, um, or how a story can build. And it's really an interesting, I'd say almost scientific take on, on the, on I guess the mindset of what people have on a place on a on a place and whether or not and some people take pride in it some people they take it's kind of a warning um, but I would say if you're wanting to actually look at almost a serious take on why people like to weave stories um, this would be I would recommend this highly on the list um, the second the third book. Um, I read was, well, after Ghostland, I actually really started getting, I really wanted to read a ghost story. So I decided um, to read um, Kill Creek by um, Scott Thomas. Um, 
the story pretty much goes is that there is a house that's been haunted in, um, it's been ha haunted in Kansas for about 150 years. Everybody knows to stay away from it. Um, but then a uh, YouTuber, so fittingly enough, famous YouTuber decides that he's gonna get a bunch of horror authors who have kind of, who are either kind of been has-beens or are kind of teetering on maybe, on maybe having to sell out to survive into this one place and they're gonna spend uh, a night there because you know what's the worst that could happen? Everything's gonna be great. Um, so the funny thing about it is though, is that the haunt, the obviously spooky things happen, um, but they don't start happening until after they leave. Um, I don't wanna give away too much because I feel like that's going to be um, as important to the story, but it's, it's definitely more of a psychological terror than I'd say gory and um, while I would say um, it didn't keep me up at night because I'm a little jaded, it did, you know, maybe maybe I thought twice about like a door creaking or something like that. Um, and then um, and then I would say finally, um, I read a graphic novel called, um, you know, this is very cheery, uh, Something is Killing the Children by uh, James Tynan the, the Fourth. Um, it essentially takes place in a small Midwestern town where kids are disappearing. Um, and what kids um, do uh, that are found aren't in a pleasant state. Um, it is, it is, can be rather disturbing. Um, one child that survives is talks about monsters that are coming out of the woods and uh, nobody leaves them except a woman by the name of Erica Slaughter, which the best way I can describe it is if you took Buffy the Vampire Slayer put maybe a decade on her and made her very, very jaded, but still kind of nice. And um, that's um, and that's who she is. And the art is stunning. It's really, it is very surreal and dark. Um, if I had one criticism, criticism about it, I think that it is, it doesn't, it raises a lot of questions before, and it doesn't really answer them. However, it's obviously the it's the first in a series and it seems like it's doing pretty well so as a like a first uh as a act one goes it's i think a great setup and i am looking forward to reading more and uh i mean if if that if a book does that for you i can't really argue um with the results um so i am now going to introduce uh my colleague dana and uh thank you so much thanks greg um what was the nonfiction book? Was it Ghostland you were just talking about? That sounds really good. I'm writing that down and putting that on my to read list. Um, so uh, hi, um, I'm Dana. Um, I've never done a book talk or led a book group before. So this is um, newbie time for me. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay. So the book I'm reading right now is Kim Jong-born 1982 by Cho Namju. Um, so this book came out in Korea in 2016 and the English translation came out earlier this year. Uh, I don't often read books in translation, but I'm realizing that that has been cutting me off from a lot of literature and a lot of diverse voices. So that's something I'm trying to change right now. Um, so this book tells a story of Kim ji Young, who, as the title says, is a Korean millennial woman and a stay-at-home mom who begins to channel voices of other women, both dead and alive. Um, and it's really an examination of just the vast amounts of everyday sexism that these women experience, um, some of which is familiar to me as a woman and other types are more specific to Korean culture. Um, Goodreads really summed it up the best. They said um, that it's, um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Goodreads says it's um, a book that, quote, follows one woman's psychic deterioration in the face of rigid misogyny, end quote, which is a much better summation than I could do. Um, right now, I'm a little bit more than halfway through. Um, I don't think I'd give it five stars out of five, uh, maybe a solid three and a half to four, but you know, I'm still reading it, so there's still time for me to change my mind. And I also found out today that there's a movie version that came out last year. So now that's um, that's on my to watch list. Let's see. 
sorry, there we go. The book I just finished is The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. Um, so for a little background, I've been fascinated by the 1918 flu, um, which you know a lot of people have, but fun funnily enough, my fascination started a few months prior to COVID. Um, I read The Last Town on Earth by Thomas Mullen and uh, bonus plug, that's a really good book, I recommend it. Um, it's about a town that quarantines itself in an effort to keep the flu away. And it's fascinating. Um, I never really learned about the Spanish flu. So I was just like, I'm a huge history nerd anyway. So I just sort of dove in. And when COVID hit, I kind of low key panicked because I had all these images of the 1918 pandemic in my head. Um, and I fed that panic by continuing to read everything I could get my hands on, which probably wasn't the healthiest, but you know, it is what it is. Um, Circling back, anyway, um, I heard about the pull of the stars, which um, it takes place in Dublin at the height of the 1918 flu. I put it on hold right away. Um, I'd read Room by Emma Donahue and I really liked it and really liked her writing style. So when this book came in, I was pumped. Um, I devoured it. I think it probably would have been a one sitting read if I didn't have a toddler at home. Um, the whole story spans only two or three days it takes place mainly inside uh, Dublin Hospital in the Women's Maternity and Fever Ward. Um, it took me a little while to get into it at first. Um, and I was kind of frustrated that there aren't really chapters. It's just four very long sections. So I found it hard, you know, reading at night, wanting, like being exhausted, wanting to get to a place where I could stop reading, but there were no places to stop and it was getting better and better. So I just didn't want to stop. So I was staying up way too late reading with this one. Um, but it was really good. I ended up loving it. Um, I felt like I was right in there with those women in that ward. I cried at the end. It was, you know, all kinds of in my feelings. Um, you know, I haven't read any of Donahue's other novels, but between this one and Room, I think she really shows her talent for storytelling with an extremely limited setting, whether it's a maternity ward or a single room. So I highly recommend this one. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz. Hello, how's it going? I hope I'm full screen now. I don't know if I am, but if I'm not, enjoy the view. Um, so I just need to bring up my notes, which I didn't do because I'm super unprepared for everything in life. Great, okay. So my first book is How to Be a Conscious Eater by Sophie Egan. Um, making food choices is hard. As it turns out, jalapeno poppers do not count as a vegetable. Um, very disappointed to learn that. But um, buying food is even harder because, you know, like I really enjoyed grocery shopping before I understood what chemicals are added to food and nitrates and what different additives and how many calories and added sugars and trans fats are. It's very confusing. Um, and then once you add in trying to reduce your carbon footprint, because a lot of climate change is powered by the agricultural system, unfortunately, um, it just makes grocery shopping a huge pain in the butt. So this little guide is a great tool to figure out if something is good for your own personal health, good for the people and the animals in our food creation and distribution system, uh, and if it's good for the planet. Those three areas are really hard to balance. Um, it's divided into four sections. So stuff that comes from the ground, aka plants, stuff that comes from animals, aka meat, dairy, eggs, stuff that comes from factories, so like prepared foods, and stuff that comes from restaurant kitchens. So what to do when you're dining out. Albeit we can't really use that part that much right now, but who knows. Um, so I'm mostly using the first two chapters to help me make the best decisions for produce and dairy that is good for my own body, good for the other people of the world, and good for the environment. My next book is Superman Smashes the Clan. Uh, it's written by Jean Luen Yang, and the art is by the illustration team out of Japan called Guri Hiru. Um, I love this graphic novel. I'm generally more of a Marvel, Marvel Comics fan than a DC Comics fan. Um, but I saw the author speak at the Public Library Association's last meeting, 
Um, thanks to the friends of the Waltham Public Library for supporting staff going to those. And um, he's such an awesome, cool guy. And I was like, oh, I need to read this. So this is an adaptation of a, um, a storyline from the 1946 radio program, The Adventures of Superman. So this is not this is not a new story. This was originally written in one form or another back in the 40s. So in this graphic novel, um, the clan of the Fiery Cross, AKA the Ku Klux Klan, um, begins harassing a Chinese American family, the Lees, and committing acts of terror across Metropolis. Um, when that happens, the two Lee children, Tommy and Roberta, and Superman have to stand up and fight back for what is right. Um, their stories become intertwined and um, this graphic novel is definitely appropriate for tweens, teens, and adults, or anybody who wants to read diverse stories about fitting in social justice or superheroes. I really love the main character, Roberta Lee. She um, goes through a really great transformation and becomes more confident in herself. Um, and it's really wonderful to see that. I wish I had been able to read comics like that when I was a tot. Um, and then my last book, which still has my bookmark in it from where I'm currently in it, um, is Van Life by Foster Huntington. So recently my husband and I have been toying with the idea of converting a cargo van into a little camper for weekend getaways. Neither of us have any construction or automotive experience, so I'm sure it's gonna go great. I'm the type to just sort of dive right into a project without asking questions and getting totally overwhelmed and giving up. But my husband is much more methodical than I am. So we're reading a bunch of different books on converting vehicles into little homes. Van Life is a showcase of converted vans and school buses from around the world. So South America, Africa, I'm fairly confident that all the continents with the exception of Antarctica are represented in this book. Um, it doesn't give a lot of information on how to actually go from van to camper. Um, so if you're looking on how, like, what kind of flooring should you put in? How do you install a solar panel? What's up with composting toilets? This is not the book for that. But the pictures in it are beautiful. It's straight out of an Instagram influencer's um, account. It's beautiful. And there's a lot of different kinds of people who are using these types of vehicles that are mentioned in this book. Um, so if it doesn't inspire some sort of wanderlust in you, then I would be very surprised. Um, hopefully it will make me actually do research on how to complete this project instead of just staring at beautiful pictures. Those are my choices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, and thank you everyone. Um, that was great. I loved hearing about everyone's choices and what you read. Um, Superman Smashes the Clan sounds amazing. Um, I, I love American Born Chinese, which is by the same um, writer. Uh, who also was at one point the Young People's Ambassador to Literature um, a few years ago. And I um, also I also want to read Ghostland and that cheese book. I totally agree with Greg, Amber, I want that. Um, and Dana, I adore that you uh, have gotten through COVID by just learning more about another pandemic. <laughs> I, I don't know, has it made you feel better or has it had the desired effect? I'm kidding. No. <laughs> no. Um, so um, I'm curious, we talked a lot about books. Um, we do a monthly staff reads as well. And we often talk about movies and TV shows and that we've been watching or music we've been listening to. I wonder um, what sorts of shows and movies you've all been watching. Anyone like to start? I'm, I'll go, I guess I'll- That's okay. Oh, sorry, Laura. No, Amber, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with fear of hyping this too much because I don't, you know, if you if you hype it too much, by the time someone watches it, they think, "What was she talking about?" But I will tell anyone who will listen to me about Perry Mason that is on HBO, recently done by HBO, and um, I knew nothing. Well, while I was, I knew it was a prequel, so we learn how Perry Mason becomes Perry Mason. But I have to be honest that when I thought of Perry Mason, I was picturing Matlock. So that shows how little I actually knew about Perry, Ma the character Perry Mason. But in any case, this is set in the early 30s in California. I thought it was well written. The soundtrack is good. The cinematography is great. The story is great. Matthew Reese is great. All the acting is great. Um, 
you know, I know HBO is a, a paid channel, but honestly, I think this show covers the cost of the monthly subscription. It was, I highly recommend that. And hopefully it will be out on DVD someday soon and we'll have it here at the library. And then I also recently watched um, kind of, and it's a bit dark, this show, um, I believe is called My Life is Murder. It's a bit more on the lighter side. It's set in Melbourne, Australia. And I have to admit, I had never, I didn't watch Xena. So I have never seen Lucy Lawless in anything. And she's completely charming. And I want to go to Melbourne now. Uh, you know, I, it's, she's a retired police detective who's sort of drawn back in each episode to solve, uh, to help solve an unsolved crime. And she's witty and funny and has a bit of an edge to her and the, you know, it's not too, it's not too gritty. So it's not too heavy if, if um, you can't handle that right now, which is completely understandable, but um, we do have that one. That was a library DVD. So that one is available to borrow from the library, but I highly recommend both of those. I've heard such good things about the new Perry Mason. I, um, it's, it's the same thing. Cause I remember the Raymond Burr, no, Raymond Burr, right? Am I, it's the problem that I'm a librarian without having a uh, looking up something at my disposal. This is, uh, yes, I believe it's you're in headlights right now, but, um, yeah, I, I too had sort of thought of it as kind of, um, you know, something, and I remember enjoying it, but I, I've heard like amazing things about this. And I, I also have a HBO subscription. Um, I had got it for His Dark Materials when that was out last several months ago. So uh, yeah, I definitely want to check that out. Um, one thing I've been, I was watching, I binge watched it actually was The Babysitter's Club, on uh, the new version on Netflix. Um, I am the Babysitter's Club generation. I was in sixth grade when those books came out. So I went from being a year younger to them, to being the same age, to being a year older, to now I'm old enough to be their mother which is depressing. Um, and I really watched, so Netflix dropped the new show probably about a month, month and a half ago at this point. And I, I really at first just watched it for nostalgia reasons. I thought, well, you know, cause I love this as a kid. I genuinely really loved this show. I thought they updated it great for 2020. I was curious how they were gonna do that. Um, you know, for example, um, Claudia, the girl whose room they meet in for their club meetings, they meet because she has her own phone line, which I wasn't really sure how that was going to play in 2020. And they do a really clever, she sells her own phone in her room, but they actually make it relevant for today. Um, the parents are actually much more realized and developed as characters, which is great because they're played by people my age. Um, I thought they really did a lot of great updates to the, the cast. It's a much more diverse group of girls than it was in the original books. Um, I really, I love what they did with the relationship between Marianne and her father without spoiling anything. Um, in the books, Marianne's father was like, he had one, he was one note, just strict father, that was it. In the, the show, they really um, play up that relationship and they really give a lot more nuance to it. And also um, the actor who plays her father, um, I know him best as Kevin from Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Sean from The Good Place, if anyone watches those shows. I. He's really good. I, I just would not picture him. And then in the, in the sake of being old, Alicia Silverstone plays Christie's mother, which I, oh dear. But um, because again, my age, but she's great. I, um, I, I just really enjoyed it. It's, it's just, and it's just a lovely show. Um, there also is a shout out that I think only like really serious fans of the Babysitter's Club will get. There was always a coincidence in the books involving two characters having the same last name that never gets addressed ever and in the show they actually address that coincidence and i was i felt so seen after 33 years of being quite frankly annoyed that that never got it i did i felt that moment in the 10 hours or so of this this new show was for me personally i know it wasn't but I guess that's vain of me. Um, and that's on Netflix, um, which is paid, but we have Roku's at the library that have Netflix, which you can reserve right now. Um, so you can watch that. Um, anyone else wanna share some shows or discuss any of the shows that Amber and I have said so far? Uh, Liz is raising her hand. Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay. So I, generally speaking, will only watch horror films um, most of the time. So I made the very ill-advised decision to rewatch all six Paranormal Activity movies. For those who aren't familiar with the Paranormal Activity franchise, it is a found footage style horror movie series that involves um, demo demons and demonic possession. Um, wow, what a ride. I don't recommend watching all six in the course of a week and a half, which is what I did. I watched three in one day at one point and my husband was like, we need to call a priest for you because you are something else right now. Um, but I do recommend the first three in the series and the fifth movie, The Marked Ones. Um, so I was watching those. Um, I also decided in a similar vein to rewatch a movie that terrified me as a child, which was Harry and the Hendersons. Um, I, it was very different from how I remembered. And it was actually very heartwarming because Harry and the family of the Hendersons, they have this like really lovely caring relationship and that you don't usually think of when you think of a Sasquatch. Uh, incidentally, I'm very obsessed with Sasquatch. Uh, and Bigfoot type creatures in general. Um, and then the last thing is uh, my husband and I have been watching uh, The Good Place for the first time, speaking of uh, Sean from The Good Place. Tonight we are going to finish season three and it is, it has only triggered some existential angst once or twice because it is about the afterlife for those who are unfamiliar with the show. Um, but it is um, very smart, very funny. I like how it discusses morality and different types of philosophies on what it means to be a good person in a good society, um, which I think is actually very relevant to right now when we're all super divided and, and there's a lot of infighting. Um, so those are what I have been watching. Oh, one last one, sorry. I, this video movie, it's a horror movie called VFW. I just watched it last night with my husband. Can I say my husband more times? My husband and I were watching this movie. It is about a group of veterans who were probably in their 50s and 60s. Most of them fought in the Vietnam War who um, are drinking at the VFW, which one of them runs. And uh, they are attacked by a group of mutant punks who are addicted to this crazy drug called hype that gives them like super speed and superpowers. And uh, they need to fight off these punks and protect uh, the VFW. They're not necessarily punks, but like you can tell that the director was really drawing from what a stereotypical punk looks like. And if you like John Carpenter films, I recommend it. It's a pretty good um, homage to John Carpenter's style of horror filmmaking. Um, I, thanks, Liz. That was awesome. I um. I saw Harry Henderson's in the movie theater when I was probably about 11 or 12, I'm guessing. Um, that was my introduction to John Lithgow. And all I remember from that movie is John Lithgow howling in the woods looking for Harry. That was, that's like the one scene I remember from that movie. So you make me want to rewatch it. I don't remember if it scared me or not, but I, um, yeah, I actually remember what I thought of the movie. So I, I need to watch again. Um, I am not going to watch VFW. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> or paranormal activity for that <laughs> um, But I'm so glad you're loving The Good Place. I, I was thinking about doing a rewatch of that recently because I just love that show so much. I, I think every actor is just straight on. So, um, and it's always great to see Ted Danson, like what a renaissance he's had with this character. So, um, and it, it's great, I love it. Anyone else wanna, either anything that we've all said so far, or, um, Greg and then Dana, right? Sure. Um, yeah, I am tempted to do paranormal activity now, though, as ill-advised as that may be. Um, thankfully, I have a wife who will not let me do that, um, and that's a, probably a good thing. So, um, as of right now, um, during the, well, starting with the quarantine and continuing with it, one of the ways that my wife and I were able to um, keep each other, I guess, sane is we would take, like, a movie that we really liked from our childhood or teens and, like, uh, make the other one watch it. So um, I saw The Breakfast Club for the first time. Um, never, never had seen it. Um, 
not not bad. I feel like I'm missing. I feel like I'm missing some like vital moments because I didn't see it into like a developing age. Um, I think my favorite movie she's ever made me see uh, during this whole thing was What About Bob with uh, Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfuss. Um, I had really like when I think of Richard Dreyfuss, um, I think of Jaws. People who know me know I love that movie and I love sharks, but. I have to admit that's like one of the funniest movies I've seen this year. It might be the funniest movie. It is just such a strange, like surreal thing. And by the end of it, it I'm just laughing. So I would um, pretty much Bill Murray is like kind of a, a mess. And uh, Richard Dreyfuss tries to like figure out his issues for him. Um, hilarity ensues. Um, definitely would give it a watch. Um, as for, let's see, as for shows that I'm watching right now, um, I would say um, there's two that I'm really kind of been currently watching, um, much to maybe the dismay of my colleagues, because I will not be, I will not shut up about it. It's um, What We Do in the Shadows is one of my favorite shows right now. If basically it's like if you took interview with the vampire and you made it like set in the office essentially um it's a bunch of like vampires living in staten island during like now times and they're just all like like flatmates and they're trying to get along with each other um you have um guillermo who's like they're much um <laughs> much abused um familiar who's trying to be a vampire but he's always getting like sent to do their laundry and things like that um the my favorite character is um probably colin robinson he's uh kind of he's a vampire but he's different from the other ones because he's an energy vampire so pretty much imagine like any your stereotypical work drone that you know in the office who like says passive aggressive things to you or slightly annoys you he's getting energy off of it so as they say it's like they're the most common vampire you probably know one it's just it's it's hilarious um the other one um the other, uh, the other uh, one show that I'm watching right now that I'm still continuing is The Umbrella Academy, which is a very strange but really well acted show. I'm kind of, it, it doesn't always make sense, but it's essentially what would happen if you took like the X-Men, had, had Professor X be something of a distance, a distant and jerk, um, jerk of a father and then uh, have them grow up and deal with all of like the issues that that go with it. Um, again, it's very strange, but very well done there. When you start the series, you're going to be like, why? What's going on? What? How is this making sense? And then by season two, you're like, you encounter a, a, a character who is literally a goldfish with a robot bar body and he smokes a cigar and you're just like, oh, OK, that checks out. So it's um. So again, it's very, it's very strange, but it's, I think it's, it's very well done. The dynamic between all the characters, I'm, I'm really surprised I like it. Um, and, uh, oh, and uh, uh, my wife had me see Splash. Never saw that, that, that was delightful. So, you know, never, didn't, never saw it. So that's what I got. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. And before we go into Dana, um, we have a question in the chat for Liz. Um, uh, they want to know um, what is the time period setting of the movie VFW. Oh, VFW sent in the set in the what is a, apparently the present day, um, just because they taught the uh, the actors talk about fighting in Vietnam and they're all looking like they're in their fifties or sixties, possibly seventies. Um, so approximately the two thousand ten to two thousand twenty time period. I believe it came out last year originally. Thank you. Um, and uh, congratulations on finally seeing The Breakfast Club, by the way, Greg. Uh, I'm the John Hughes generation, I guess. And I, I always felt like I was actually an affront to my generation because I never liked that movie. <laughs> I know Amber's giving me a dirty look. I'm so sorry. But um, I don't know why. But I, um, I rewatched it recently for the first time in years. And I knew I was old when I sympathized with the, the principal or the teacher, whoever it is who's watching them with the Saturday morning detention of the poor guy to give up the Saturday. <laughs> but I, um, I, that just makes me old, I think. Uh, Greg, what do you, what are you, you're so funny, what are you saying? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm agreeing with you entirely and I feel really bad for the guy like on his Saturday, just, uh, <laughs> just 
Man, but then again, maybe I'm just a grumpy old man. So well, that's fine. You know, I saw it. Um, I think I was in my late 30s when I did the rewatch. So this is about six or seven years ago. And I said, no, I'm I'm definitely now entering middle age. When you sympathize with the teacher on the Breakfast Club, you are you're officially <laughs> no longer a teenager. Yeah, um, Dana, uh, you said you had some shows to share. Yeah, um, I watched the pilot of Lovecraft Country which um, I believe is an HBO show. Um, I am not like a horror person in general. I'm kind of squeamish. So this is really not my thing, but um, I was fascinated at the premise about it being, um, you know, set in the 1950s, the main character is a black man named Atticus who was searching for his missing father. And he like gets led into like Arkham country, like all kinds of HP Lovecraft stuff. Um, and it's, I heard somewhere they said it's like the twin horrors of both Jim Crow America and just complete ridiculous racism that makes me like scream at my TV and um, um, like Lovecraft creatures, like just bizarre things. So that I've only seen the pilot. I know I think the second one um, aired on Sunday. So I need to play catch up on that. But that was um, something very different for me, but very interesting. Um, and a lighter show I've been watching is Ted Lasso, which is an Apple TV original. Um, Jason Sudeikis, Sudeikis, sorry that I'm butchering his name. Um, he plays a football coach from like Kansas City area who gets recruited to coach a Premier League soccer team in England. And it's it's really good. Like I, um, he had been involved in a, a really short little thing um, like a promo when <clears throat> excuse me when NBC started showing Premier League games they had um, um, the Ted Lesso character take over the coaching of my club that I support um, Tottenham Hotspur and it was it was just funny but like not as good as the show like he was sort of bumbling around like what's the offside rule and how many countries are in this country and it, it was just kind of playing on the stereotypical American like football, not football, but football, like that kind of thing. But the show is like heartwarming and like charming and really funny. And the characters have redemption arcs and they're kind to each other. And it's also super silly and, you know, a, a little bit of soccer thrown in. It's not really like a soccer show. It's more just about the characters. And I've been really enjoying it. Um, a movie I watched recently was An American Pickle. Um, with Seth Rogen, I'm not sure where that like played on, um, like what what platform, but it was you know right up my history nerd alley. Like a a man falls into a vat of um, pickle juice basically and is preserved perfectly for a hundred years, and then wakes up, meets his great grandson, and they're just kind of trying to figure things out. And I was expecting it to be kind of silly like that, like oh like man from the from like 1920, 1919, whatever, is trying to figure out modern life. But um, it was really touching and there were some like really deep moments in it. I um, sort of like the immigrant experience and the um, Jewish immigrant experience. I think I, it was really good. I hope we get it on, uh, on DVD at the library. I think that's on HBO Max the uh, Seth Rogen. I, yeah, I saw ads for that and I, I'm really intrigued by it. I mean, that's about when my ancestors would have come to the US. Um, you know, similar circumstances, no one got pickled, obviously, and came that way. Um, but I, yeah, I, I was intrigued when I saw the ad for it. So I'm glad to hear that you like it. Um, Greg, have you seen Lovecraft Country? I'm curious, um, since you did the book recently at your book club. Um, I, I have not because one of the reasons is, is that A, I'm trying to catch up on, on the Umbrella Academy and um, B, I know that if I do watch that, sh um, watch the show, I'm going to want to binge it and I will get grumpy if I can only watch like one or two episodes and, you know, nobody, and uh, nobody will be able to deal with me because um, how solid I am. Uh, but I'm really excited. Um, a lot of my friends have said some good things about it. I really like the book. Um, I agree. Um, definitely agree with you, Dana, though. Um, the parts of the book that, you know, there are Lovecraftian monsters and they're creepy, but definitely the parts of the book that 
are disturbing and also downright terrifying are, you know, the fact that they're dealing with, you know, Jim Crow laws in the 1950s. It's, um, but I think it's very well written. And um, I mean, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peele and I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, thanks. I just have one complaint about it mm -hmm. is that part of it takes place in Massachusetts and like, I'm, and all the people have like Southern kind of country accents. And I'm like, they're not from Worcester. Come on now. So other <laughs> than that, I think it's uh thumbs up. Awesome. Although sometimes better than the fake Boston accent in a movie. Like I, we could have a whole YouTube presentation about bad Boston accents on film. <laughs> Actually bad accents in general. I feel like whenever someone in film plays a character from a region that they don't live in, I. I feel like they never quite hit the dialect quite right. But of course, you always, the one where you grew up is the one you always notice the most, I think. Um, listen, any other movies or shows? Um, I did watch rewatch Bambi recently. I have a friend who's trying to rewatch all the Disney movies and we've been doing Zoom watch parties and uh, just as traumatizing at 45 as it was at six. So, uh, Beautiful animation, <laughs> I'll say that. Um, but that's that's it. I don't I don't ever need to rewatch that um, again. Um, all right. Well, if anyone, I'm going to um, go back to speaker view, and just say um, to our watchers, uh, thank you so much uh, for watching this. We hope you enjoyed it, listening to us talk about um, books and some movies and shows. Um, as a, uh, just to let you know that all the books we mentioned today are available um, either in the Minuteman Library Network um, as print materials, um, and we can get them for contactless delivery. A lot of them are also available through Overdrive or Hoopla, which are services we use that have ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. Um, they are available either through um, the links for Hoopla or Overdrive on our website or you can download the Libby by Overdrive app or the Hoopla app on your smartphone or your um, mobile, uh, other mobile device, uh, your tablet. Um, Hoopla also has an app for most um, smart televisions, um, such as Roku, Apple TV, um, Fire Stick, Chromecast. And um, again, please join us in a little over a month from now on September 30th at 2.30 p.m for another episode, if you will, of we'll tell you what we're reading. Um, if you'd like to tell us what you're reading, again, please um, tell us in the comments below. Um, you can watch this video on demand. Um, I will hopefully edit out the first minute um, when I uh, had some technical difficulties. So thank you also for dealing with that. This is our first time doing this. Um, and if you would like to share while you're reading in a little bit um, beyond the comments, um, you can actually join us on September 21st at 7 p.m. for a Zoom chat that will not be on YouTube for a discussion between library staff and um, library users about um, what we're reading and what we've been watching. We've been doing that, I think, four or five months now. We've been doing Tell Us What You're Reading on Zoom, and that's been really fun. So please join us. And again, please visit our website at walthampubliclibrary.org. And um, for all of our virtual services, as well as our events calendar, please like and subscribe our um, channel on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button, man. And um, thank you again. Um, this was wonderful. And um, have a good afternoon, everybody. All right, so I ended the stream. Let me just end the stream.